Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, tell about uh, some experiments that we've been doing at the University of Connecticut. Uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, recall some memories about Dan. Unfortunately, I've never collaborated with him directly, but as a young graduate student at MIT, I noticed uh, the work that he was doing uh, with uh, Goldenberg and Norman Ramsey. And I think at that time, Dan, you were a postdoc at Harvard, is, or were you on the faculty? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, uh, Dan has uh, been an inspiration and role model for me for many decades. Um, much later, uh, after uh, I was at the University of Connecticut, I visited uh, Dan's lab and I heard, uh, I think, Dan talk about Rydberg Adams at least four times and he suggested that he might give me a medal if I came to another one of his talks, but it w they, were, they were elegant and uh, beautiful talks. And, and then uh, when Serge Roche visited Dan uh, and they started working on cavity QED, uh, I also followed that with great interest. Uh, I actually used his, uh, his quick calculus book uh, with uh, some of our students that had not learned calculus very well, and uh, I used his undergraduate uh, text uh, with Kalenko, uh, particularly for the many worked examples that were uh, very good things to teach undergraduate physicists. Uh, some years later, I chaired a Gordon conference in atomic physics, and I remember uh, having extensive conversations with Bill Phillips, uh, Dan's student, uh, and then uh, in, uh, uh, and, and I think that, uh, it, it was either that one or the next Gordon conference that uh, Ketterly reported the uh, B, C, and sodium, and, of course, the, the BCs in, in, in Boulder and at, uh, at Rice. Uh, and in 1988, uh, I, I uh, noticed that they had started the experiments on the hydrogen BEC. And in 1998, after 10 years, I was fortunate enough to make a sabbatical with David Pritchard and at the end of the year, I had not seen the experiment, so I asked Dan if I could visit the experiment. And we set up a schedule for visiting the experiment, and uh, that, uh, they, I, I went to see the lab, and they had just gotten their first real result the night before. So this was an exciting uh, end to my sabbatical. Uh, so uh, let's go on with, now let's see. How did we... Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is the topic. Uh, uh, sympathetic cooling and reactions of trapped ions by collisions of ultra-cold neutral atoms in a hybrid trap, meaning a hybrid ion neutral trap. And uh, most of the work has been done by uh, these three graduate students and our collaborator, Frank Narducci, who was at the Naval... Uh, uh, surface and uh, naval air station in Patuxent River, and uh, he was a student of Leonard Mandel at uh, in quantum optics at Rochester, and he has been a great help to us in in uh, some of our optical uh, our optics work. Uh, so sympathetic cooling, uh, I would define as one confined atomic or molecular species cooled by interaction with a second directly cooled species. And the second species is normally laser cooled by light pressure forces. Uh, there's a lot of expertise here in that. Uh, so uh, David Wineland and others have uh, exploited ion-ion sympathetic cooling where you laser cool one species and then you co-trap uh, in an ion trap a, a second species which then collides uh, by Coulomb interactions. Neutral-neutral uh, sympathetic cooling, of course, is uh, very important in studying degenerate Fermi gases and Bose-Einstein constant 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 constant
Uh, the kind of sympathetic cooling that I want to describe here is, uh, involves a, a charged particle and a neutral particle. And until recently, there's been very little work in this area. Uh, the, the dominant long-range process is simply the polarization potential, 1 over r to the fourth potential of an ion inducing a dipole, a dipole moment in the neutral. And the beauty of this is that it's a universal interaction. Uh, so it's dominated, if you have a single charge, then it's pro the interaction is proportional. C4 is proportional to the dipole polarizability of the neutral partner which may be in the ground state or the excited state. And uh, in the case of sodium, the polarizability is three times higher in the excited state. We believe that this technique uh, shows promise for investigating cold molecular ions as well as atomic ions, especially studies of internal state selection, cooling mechanisms, perhaps precision spectroscopy and ion molecule reactions that may be important in space. Uh, there, are, uh, there are applications to quantum gates. Uh, and uh, I'll mention something about cold ion neutral reactions, which are dominated by the same long range interaction. Uh, our own project uh, involves trapping the ions in a Powell quadrupole trap and collisions with ultra-cold trapped atoms uh, trapped in a magneto-optic trap, a conventional MOT, where we partially overlap, uh, overlap the trapping volumes. And initially, uh, I think my favorite atom is the same of, as Bill Phillips, namely sodium. Uh, we're working with sodium ions, calcium ions, and sodium atoms. This is a schematic of the apparatus that we have in our lab. External anti-Helmholtz coils. We have the usual six beams, uh, 589 nanometer dye laser, which uh, produces our MOT at the center of the apparatus. And then we have four segmented rods that form a Powell uh, ion trap. Uh, the initial design that we used had some end caps here that were blocking the optical axis along the, uh, the trap axis, which is the X3 or Z axis. Uh, and uh, so we went to the segmented design that many people have used and found that to be remarkably effective by applying DC potentials to the uh, end segments. You can apply a positive DC voltage you can trap positive ions in the center segments, which are at DC ground. And then uh, in the case of an ion that we cannot uh, observe by fluorescence, uh, we can extract the contents of the ion trap, which, which is this gray uh, cigar-shaped cloud, by raising the potential on the left-hand side and lowering the potential on the right to accelerate the ions through a mesh and into a channel tron. So there's a lot of acceleration to the right of the mesh, and the uh, mesh serves to shield the interaction region from the high voltages on the ion detector. So uh, here are some photographs. Uh, this was our original uh, ion trap. We've now uh, uh, rebuilt this, uh, but there's, uh, there's our MOT in the center. Uh, this is what the apparatus looks like in the laboratory. We have some square uh, shim coils that we can use to move the, uh, to change the overlap between the neutrals and the ions by moving the MOT around. Uh, we use a, uh, an argon pumped uh, dye laser here that my students are constantly swearing at. We'd like to get the uh, solid state version for 589, but we can't afford it at the moment. And uh, this is uh, our channel tron. Uh, no, I'm sorry, these are the, these are the uh, atom sources. Uh, we have some, some uh, Alvatec uh, little ovens or some, some getters to supply sodium vapor. And uh, we're working with uh, essentially a vapor cell mod. Uh, so now I want to show you if I can get out of this for a moment, I would, I would like to show you 
a short video. Uh, I may not be... Well, maybe what I should do here to, in order to uh, get through this in time is to recommend that you take a look at a video that uh, Ted Hench produced a number of years ago. Uh, and uh, let's see. Now I've got to get back to the, to the uh, full screen again. If you go to YouTube and you Google uh, Powell Trap, you, you will see a beautiful video that uh, Ted Hench produced uh, about the same time as uh, Wolfgang Powell got the Nobel Prize for uh, developing uh, the radio frequency traps. Here is our uh, current trap that has, here, here's the center segment, which we've been told is a little bit too long, but this gives us a kind of a U-shaped confining potential along the z-axis. And then we have radial confinement by applying RF to the opposite diagonals at about 700 kilohertz. And this causes uh, motion, which is a little, th these are some simulations. There are actually two ions here. One of them has been, has been cooled at the center. And then you can see the kind of trajectories. Uh, this is an end view and here's a, uh, here's a side view of the kind of uh, combination of a secular motion in the uh, average potential, the pseudo potential of the Powell trap. Uh, you can think of it as a saddle which is essentially rotating at a rate such that the, before the ion can fall off of the saddle it changes from being a saddle going down to a saddle going up. Uh, and uh, this is an old story, but I highly recommend the, the video on, on YouTube. Here's, a, here's our uh, ion detector, so it's destructive detection. This is a simulation showing that when we apply the fields to extract the ion sample, that the trajectories all go into the detector. Uh, the detector uh, has a high but not 100% efficiency. Okay, so the goal here is to investigate collision reactions and cooling rates between co-trapped ions and neutrals in a, over a wide temperature range. The cross-sections have been calculated in some typical cases and they're very large. At, at a millikelvin, for example, with uh, calcium on sodium, you have a, uh, an elastic cross-section uh, of the order of uh, three, three million atomic units. So compared with the neutral-neutral cross-sections, uh, th these are very large effects. Uh, even at a Kelvin, you're at a half a million atomic units. And uh, similarly, uh, if you take sodium plus on sodium, uh, the cross-section uh, is comparable at a Kelvin. And uh, our calculations here are given in this paper. So here is an example of the elastic cross-section as calculated. This, uh, if you really were in a BEC, you'd be in S-wave scattering. And uh, this is a quantal calculation. Uh, and you can see some vestiges of different partial waves. And then when you get to uh, about one millikelvin and on up, you can see that the cross-section follows a power law Langevin type curve that you can calculate that cross-section classically. Uh, and uh, we've got a number of calculations on this, this system uh, in, in that paper. So this is about the time we started doing the experiments. It's been sort of a 10-year effort, and I don't claim that it was as difficult as the uh, hydrogen BEC, but uh, uh, some of these, sometimes these things take longer than you expect. Here is a simulation of a single calcium ion cooled by a sodium MOT of, of this density, assuming elastic scattering only. Uh, and uh, you can see that in, uh, with, within about a half a second or less, a few tenths of a second, the amplitude of the motion uh, goes down to a very small fraction of the initial amplitude. Uh, we started with calcium ions at 1,000 Kelvin, and uh, there was a background sodium vapor at 10 to the minus 9. Uh, now here are some, I'm going to need a crib sheet for this. These are some other simulations that we did. 
uh, this, this black curve A is just a, a test uh, where we have collisions with the background gas. Uh, curve, curve B is what happened, that's the, uh, well, there's, a, there's some confusion here between, unfortunately, between curve B and curve D. Uh, curve D uh, is when the mass ratio is unfavorable, so that's when uh, the ion is, is about a quarter of the mass of the, uh, of the, uh, the Mott atoms, then uh, here we are at uh, about a millikelvin, and you can see that you get heating. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a significant one for us is with uh, equal mass, sodium plus on sodium, we can go from uh, about a tenth of an EV average energy down to about 10 to the minus 6 in something like one second for a single ion. Here's a comparison between... Uh, between sodium, where you can see there are intervals of heating and cooling, and calcium, uh, which has a more favorable mass ratio, uh, where you get, uh, let's see, this one is actually uh, more than one ion. Uh, that one is, I think, 10 ions. Uh, and so uh, here you see with one ion you can, you can get down to about 10 millikelvin in a little over a second. If, if you have 10 ions, then uh, according to the simulation we can only get down to uh, a few kelvin uh, in, a, in a period of a fraction of a second. Uh, and uh, over here we have five ions and uh, this, let's see, this one is, um, okay, this, this is all calcium ions. This is, this is uh, sympathetic cooling of calcium ions, of five calcium ions uh, at a relatively low density mod, and then if we increase the mod to, uh, to a, a very high density, maybe unrealistic, about 10 to the 12, atoms per cubic centimeter, uh, we can actually crystallize the ions into a, a, a Wigner crystal here. And you can see the phase transition, and then you can see the heating and cooling of the crystal. So we did some extensive uh, simulations which were published last year in Physical Review. Uh, and now let's look at the experiment. Uh, so here are the simulations uh, published last year, and here are the actual experiments which represent uh, um, Dr. Sivaraj's PhD thesis. Uh, that's a, okay, so here, here is the extraction, destructive extraction of the ions by uh, taking the end segment at the end and raising its potential and then lowering the potential on the right-hand side and we can vary the trapping time uh, and then uh, we can make the ions uh, by using excited atoms and then photoionizing uh, with uh, a 405 nanometer laser. Uh, one of the experiments we did to try to measure the temperature of an ion that has uh, no uh, optical transition available for fluorescence is to suddenly drop the trap depth for a period of um, maybe 100 microseconds so we can trap for seconds or up to a minute or more and then suddenly drop the RF and the trap depth uh, and then extract the ions at the end. And uh, so here we have uh, three different uh, indications with sodium ions that uh, were cooling. Uh, this one is uh, with uh, no cooling and we have a loss due to RF heating in the trap. You can see uh, more than a minute it goes down uh, by about half and then the red curve is with the mop turned on. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got it backwards. The black curve is with the mop on and the red curve shows the the uh, uh, time constant for losing the ions is much uh, shorter uh, when you have no cooling. Here, uh, what we do is to lower the RF, as I showed in the last slide, 
And if we have no, no cooling in this case, so I should have changed the, the uh, labels here, uh, but if we, if we uh, lower the trap depth, uh, this is the change, uh, the amount of lowering. So with a small amount of lowering, not, not much happens. Most of the ions remain. And then uh, uh, you, can, you can lower them to the point where 50% of the ions remain, and then you can convert this into a temperature. And we get a temperature of between 1 and 2,000 Kelvin here. And then if we take the 50% point over here, we get a temperature of, of roughly uh, room temperature. Uh, so uh, this was a, a sample of a lot of ions, about uh, 5,000 ions. And significantly, the two curves cross at the same trap depth of, of 0.4 EV. This one, I think, is a little bit of a red herring, but the black curve essentially shows that as we move the MOT relative to the ion cloud, we have a sort of a flat top here, and then this, the ion signal suddenly drops off. We had hoped that this would uh, be a measure of the size of the ion cloud, but we now believe that as soon as the MOT gets away from the center of the ion trap where you have micromotion, uh, that uh, the cooling efficiency drops off. So this may well give us an upper limit on the size of the MOT rather than of the ion cloud. But uh, anyway, there are several different experiments that are reported in the paper uh, that indicate uh, cooling of a large number of ions, like 5,000 ions. And then we can do some modeling using uh, the theory of non-neutral plasmas, essentially looking at the, uh, treating it as a classical plasma and treating the uh, ion trap potential as a harmonic oscillator potential. Uh, and then you have space charge, but at the densities that we're using, uh, the space charge is essentially decreases the spring constant because it's like a harmonic oscillator trap. And uh, you, can, you can make a sort of, uh, um, phase diagram here, you can, you can, this is a radius in, in dimensionless units of the Debye length, which is proportional to the square root of the temperature over the density. Uh, and uh, so you can see what the full width at half maximum of the ion cloud would be as a function of temperature. Uh, so we're continuing to work on that. Uh, now we have some uh, planned experiments uh, and uh, I don't want to uh, take a lot of time on this. We, we thought that the calcium ions would, would be uh, cooled better than the sodium ions, uh, and the advantage of that Professor. would be that one could actually look Professor. at the fluorescence. We need to finish, please. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, so when we did the experiment, uh, we found that as a function of the percent of the time that we had exposure to the sodium, uh, to the MOT, uh, the sodium ions increased and the calcium ions went down, so it appears that there's a charge transfer reaction, uh, and uh, even under the high vacuum of this system, you can see uh, uh, reactions of that nature. So uh, this is uh, going to be explored further, but this prevented us from uh, really making a, a cooling measurement. We're also interested in the possibility of looking at internally hot molecular ions and using the interaction of the molecular ions with the cold atoms to relax the, the internal temperature. Uh, and uh, here is an example of some calculations that some of our theorist friends have been doing for the NACA plus molecule. These are all people in our department uh, and uh, there are some possible reactive channels. Uh, this one uh, here involves uh, an excited sodium atom and a ground state calcium ion. And this green channel uh, involves a calcium atom in the metastable state interacting with a ground state ion. You can see, for example, here that there's a sequence of avoided crossings that can lead to the charge transfer process. Uh, so the conclusions, uh, the sympathetic cooling works, uh, and 
after we started doing this, uh, well, it's a universal type of interaction, both atomic and molecular ion experiments. Uh, these are the people that have been involved over the years, support from NSF. Uh, and uh, since we started doing this, uh, a lot of other groups have gotten interested. Uh, uh, Volatich's group at MIT, uh, Eric Hudson at UCLA, did a terbium on calcium mott. Uh, Denschlag's group, a barium ion on a rubidium BEC. So this is a single ion in a BEC. And Michael Curl at Cambridge uh, has studied a single a terbium ion. Uh, Village's group is uh, looking at calcium ions and uh, there's now a group in India that is doing an experiment that is very similar to the one that I've reported for sodium. This is the uh, single terbium ion in a BEC. I think uh, uh, Reiner Blatt will recognize the type of ion trap uh, that he uses. Uh, and uh, it's a rather sophisticated apparatus, but uh, what they found was that the temperature could drop. Uh, this is milliseconds now, in 10 milliseconds, uh, it drops down to about one and a half Kelvin. Uh, and if you put one ion, a terbium ion, and a rubidium BEC over the course Professor, of, we need to finish, please. Uh, you can see that it destroys the BEC. A single ion will destroy the BEC. So uh, that's it.